Let me start um, to the left uh, with Carlos. Um, you know, you've talked very publicly about just how committed you are to sourcing a lot more of your electricity globally from renewables. What have you actually accomplished so far? How much do you think it's moving the needle? How optimistic are you about the near-term future? Well, not only we're committed, but we're delivering on it. So two years ago, we announced that by the year 2025, we'd like to have 100%, 100% of our purchased electricity coming from renewable sources. And in two years, we're already from zero, we're already reaching 50% by the end of this year. Uh, so if you go, for example, for a brand of ours, Budweiser, in the U.S., for example, it has a symbol that says that every Budweiser you buy in the U.S. comes from renewable sources in terms of brewing. And uh, so we have this already in Mexico, in the U.S., in Brazil, in India, China, and uh, Australia. So we're getting, we're very committed to it. Um, and in terms of the broader supply chain, I mean, when we think about inputs for your company, we're talking about aluminum, we're talking about water, we're talking about agriculture. How are you changing supply chain? What are you doing on ag? What are you doing on water? Yeah, you touched on a very important thing. I mean, no water, no beer. That, that simple. So uh, sustainability for us is, is our business. It's not just a, a part, an add-on. It's central to our business. So agriculture, uh, most of the water that we use in our business is not in the four walls of the brewery. 80% of it is in the ag business. Because of that, I mean, we, we took advantage of the 30,000 growers and farmers that we have relationships through more than 30 years around the world in all continents. And we're using now more and more technology and data analytics to predict conditions of microclimate, soil, seeds, and to try to instruct them and exchange best practice so they know exactly when to harvest, when to, 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 to plant, so they can really minimize the impact they have on the environment. How much we support? We have already 10,000 of the, that 30,000 connected to the, the technology in terms of data sharing. And as you're moving forward on these policies, how much support are you getting from the public sector around the world? Are you seeing governments saying, this is something we want to see replicated, we want to help? It's interesting you say that because the biggest barrier we have to go now from 50 to 100 percent on the renewable side is exactly the regulatory side of things. Grids that need to be smarter, uh, governments that need to allow such markets to exist where you can buy and at the same time we're not using sell back to the grid. So all those things are things that we have to work together with the governments. And because we're a global company, together with other global companies, we, we sit down with governments and try to see how we can make this a better place. So we're on agriculture right now. Sarah uh, from Grow Intelligence, you talk about a global food crisis that's being brought on by climate change. What are the interactions between agriculture and climate change in your view? Yeah, I mean, agriculture is obviously a, a, a large contributor to the climate change discussion in, in multiple forms. One that Carlos touched on, water. Um, I heard an interesting statistic today that, you know, we all know that 70% uh, of water use goes to the agricultural industry. But what I didn't know is that only 7% of that is used efficiently. So there's a lot of kind of space and uh, room to, to kind of grow efficiencies there. But the second is, is diets um, and greenhouse gas emissions due to uh, protein consumption, meat consumption, uh, and the contribution there. And so there's a really large conversation right now around what happens around shifting diets and, and what does that look like. Um, and, you know, if you think of it in the context of new economies, if you take a country like Kenya, where Grow Intelligence was actually started and then we grew to become a global company, per capita consumption of meat is at about... 10 kilograms per capita. If you look at China, it's at about 60. And the US is at 125. So if you imagine a world where sub-Saharan Africa, which is also the youngest population in the world and some of the fastest growing economies in the world, start to move to 60 kilograms per capita, what, what does it look like? And so we have to start thinking of innovations, not just in in alternative proteins, but in actually fundamentally changing the way we feed our cattle, potentially, uh, because we're also not going to stop eating meat. I mean, do you think it's realistic that large percentages of the population can be incented in a way that's meaningful to change the diet? You know, again, like I said, the youngest and fastest growing parts of the world are, are consuming very little meat today. And uh, the example I give is I'm an Ethiopian. 
The way we show wealth when you have somebody come over is you serve a, a banquet and it must include meat. If you serve one with just vegetables, just culturally, right? So demand of food is not just about tastes and preferences, it's also deeply about culture. And shifting culture doesn't happen in the span of five, 10, 15 years. So we have to start thinking of what that looks like. So t to me, it's a mix. It's not a single solution. You, you know, you didn't mention anything about Beyond Meat, the Impossible Burger, all the rest. Is that's because it's just not credible, it's taking too long, it's too niche, it's too expensive? Right now it's too expensive. The cost has been coming down drastically, and so we'll start to make measurable impact in economies like the U.S. But the U.S., as I mentioned, is consuming 125 kilograms per capita, but it's not going to be making that impact in countries like Ethiopia or Kenya or Zambia or Malawi. And so, what, you know, that's what I'm saying. It's not a one-size-fits-all solution. And we still have some fundamental challenges to, to get around, right? The, the average cow in East Africa emits four to five times more greenhouse gas emissions than the average cow in the U.S. or Australia. So there's a lot that we can do to innovate just to make sure that they emit less. So let's bring uh, our... Oh, yes? No. No. Okay. I mean, you're a former trader as well, so you're going to... A little buy recommendation on some of those stocks? <laughs> Is that we can do that? <laughs> I'm a recovering trader, but okay, I traded right. oil and gas, so no. <laughs> So let's, well, I mean, gas is a part of this, but that's, that's a whole different story. <laughs> yeah. We're not going there. Okay, let's get back to the model. Um, and let's talk about a couple of things we just discussed. Um, first, John, um, if we want to boost renewables, um, implementing a carbon price would certainly make a difference around the world. Let's talk about that. So let's bring the m model back up on the screen. And uh, there we go. So carbon price. Do you have any idea of how large of a carbon price you'd like, Ian? Um, I'm... I'm going to I mean, $50 is what we generally talk about, but I don't Great. know if you consider that enough. Let's try $50 a ton of CO2, and that matters a lot. Now, this is not a big carbon price. To put it in perspective, that would add 44 cents per gallon to gasoline in the United States, 10 euro cents per liter in Europe, and less than a 10% increase in the price of gasoline here in Beijing. So uh, it, it has a big impact, even though it's a rather modest carbon price, and we're phasing it in over 10 years. Okay, I mean, are you prepared? We had an American presidential debate just now. Are you prepared to get on that stage and say 44 cents a gallon is not a major carbon price? I'm just... Not in terms of what the, car what the climate needs. This is a huge market failure, and uh, $50 a ton is just not enough to correct that completely. Okay, let's, let's move one more and, and talk about um, ag and how about reducing methane emissions Great. from ag, uh, so which is really critical. So this goes directly what we just heard from Carlos and Sarah. Uh, if we switch to a more plant-based diet, if we reduce food waste, we're going to be reducing the emissions of methane and nitrous oxide, much of which comes from agriculture. And so let me pull that lever here. This makes quite a large difference. Methane and nitrous oxide are very powerful many times more powerful per molecule than carbon dioxide. So I've got a moderate reduction here, recognizing some of the trends that you talked about, and that matters. We're down to three degrees C. Now that's still not enough. We're still gonna lose Shanghai and Shenzhen to sea level rise. The Gulf Coast of the United States, the Netherlands, Venice is already gone, essentially. And, uh, but we're making progress. We're making progress. We're doing things that seem feasible, that industry can be aligned with. It's not dramatically crimping economic growth. I mean, in that environment with globalization, we can imagine that economic growth is reasonably robust. So let me throw one more at you, which is how about if the world is growing a little bit more? What does right. that look like? So we ha we've, we've lowered the expected warming from over four to three. That means there's going to be less climate damage that harms economic growth. So let's increase the rate of economic growth a little bit here. That's about, I think, 40, yeah, 40 or so uh, basis points per year of additional growth. That's a lot in per capita GDP. And uh, what happens is the temperature goes back up to some extent. This is not because uh, we haven't done a better job on climate, but you still have a lot of fossil fuel in the mix. We haven't really done much on oil, and we have still quite a lot of natural gas, both fossil fuels. So by faster economic growth, more air travel, more travel, more uh, consumption of carbon from food, supply chains, consumer goods, we've increased the warming again now to 3.2. And I think an important point to raise here is that part of the reason we're in such a climate fix is because of the real trade-offs that come 
from a world that has brought unprecedented numbers of citizens out of poverty. And recognizing that that is not just a one-way street, but is an actual trade-off and one that we're going to continue to deal with in the decades to come. As long as we're still on a carbon-based energy system, that's a real trade-off. What we need to do is get off the fossil fuels as fast as possible. So what else would you like to try? No, I think we're good for now. I want to go to the rest of the panel. Okay. So um, you can see we've really worked through this. Um, let me turn um, to our, our member of the Chinese government, Xi Jinping, um, who is China's special envoy for climate. And one thing I can say is that even my friends in the United States who are among the most hawkish on China have to grudgingly recognize that the Chinese are doing an awful lot on climate today compared to five, ten years ago. So I'd love to hear, and I think the audience would love to hear a little bit of the top priorities of where you think you're making success right now in the Chinese government in tackling this incredibly challenging problem. Well, the Chinese government, in tackling climate change, uh, we used our institutional advantage. First, climate action has been linked with the economy, society, environment, health, and national security, and we take them into consideration as a whole. And this enables climate action to be more acceptable to people from all walks of life, and people can participate in it. And secondly, we take concrete actions. From 2005 to 2018, we have taken um, steps to conserve energy and increase energy efficiency. We have increased by 41.2 percent. And we have been developing renewables. Renewable energy as a share of our consumption went up from 7.2 percent to 14.5 percent. Total installed capacity in China contributes to 30 percent and 44 percent of the incremental amount in terms of the cost compared with traditional thermal, uh, I think renewable energy is very competitive. And also in the process, we've been improving the efficiency of energy um, utilization and efficiency has been improved by 40 percent. And also we have been using carbon sink. Uh, our target is to increase 15 billion cubic meters forest as um, carbon sink. And uh, by 2020, our target of reducing 45 percent of the carbon intensity can be achieved two years ahead. Currently, we have achieved 45.8 percent of the carbon intensity reduction target. So we have fulfilled the target in terms of uh, dealing with the climate change. But China's GDP has tripled, and 270 people have been, uh, have been lifted from uh, poverty, and uh, we have uh, created 30 million jobs from uh, green industries, etc. So I think in this process, China has delivered economic, social development as well as climate purposes, and only in this way we can um, make further progress. Thank you. So one other quick question, because you were the chief climate negotiator, the envoy for Copenhagen, and of course that didn't lead to global agreement. Paris led to global agreement, but now the Americans have walked away. Given your experience on both sides of that, how, do, how does that make you think about the potential for international cooperation and architecture on climate going forward? In terms of climate change, we can say that China always sticks to the principle of multilateralism. In Copenhagen, because of different opinions, especially between China and the U.S., because of lack of coordination, so ultimately we only achieved a limited agreement, but this was not binding. But after that, China and U.S. stepped up cooperation. And first of all, we agreed that we have um, disagreements, but we do not criticize each other in public. And secondly, we let each other know our disagreements. And on that basis, we respect each other's core concerns. And we need to find out a solution that is acceptable to both sides and then to work internally so that we can reach consensus. Ultimately, we can find an agreement which is not the best but acceptable to both sides. I think that's the best result from multilateralism. With the joint effort of China, U.S. and other countries, Paris Agreement was made possible. It was uh, uh, signed and uh, took effect, and the heads of uh, China and U.S. Um, signed and uh, published the four joint agreements. According to then Secretary General of the U.N., uh, China made tremendous 
and a fundamental historical contribution um, for Paris Agreement. And uh, in the past, U.S. could collaborate with us, but right not now. I think as long as our core concerns have been respected and sticking to multilateralism, other issues can be solved too. I kind of want an hour on stage with you, to be honest with you. There's some follow-ups there. But I'm going to turn, to leave you off the hook for a second, Pablo Isla from Inditex, which, I mean, leading the global fashion retail industry, clearly anything you do is going to have a lot of impact downstream. What is Inditex doing to, for its supply chain to increase energy efficiency? How, how daunting is that challenge? Well, first of all, for, for those of you who don't know, Inditex is the parent company of Zara. Zara is the most global fashion brand in the, in the world. And regarding sustainability and our uh, push for sustainability, the first thing I would like to say is that uh, this is something that internally in our company is coming from our teams all across the world. Uh, I always say that the most important asset that we have in our company is our people, their commitment, their passion, and when we announced very ambitious targets regarding sustainability in the month of July, the general feeling in the company was feeling proud of belonging to a company that was taking care about sustainability. We could talk a lot about this. I would like to focus on three areas. First of all, energy, uh, two elements. The first one is that we have a commitment to, to, for our energy in the year 2025 coming from uh, renewable sources, and at the same time, we have developed a new concept of a store that we call the eco-efficient store that is a store that is consuming 20% less electricity, 50% less water. It is a reality in China for all our stores since last year. It will be a reality all across the world this year for Thara and for the whole group. It will be a reality next year. So currently 90% of our stores in the world are eco-efficient. Second, regarding the supply chain that you were mentioning, well, we are working a lot. We know that being a global leader in our sector uh, means that we also need to lead in terms of sustainability. In July, we announced very significant uh, and very ambitious targets in terms of sustainable raw materials for 100% for linen, for uh, cellulosic fibers, uh, cotton, 100% uh, uh, recycled polyester, all these uh, commitments for the year 2025, and at the same time working permanently with our supply chain to be more sustainable from every point of view. Uh, for example, we developed with the chemical industry what we call the list that was our standard about what chemical products could be used in the manufacturing process, and now this is becoming an industry standard. And at the same time, working very seriously in everything which has to do with reutilizing, working with NGOs all across the world, for example, something very specific, uh, we began in, in Spain, uh, Shanghai and Beijing, and now we are expanding New York, Paris, London. The possibility when you order online, we take back, if you want, uh, garments that you don't need anymore, and also working in recycling, particularly with the MIT. Now, you said some of these are becoming industry standards. Yeah. In relatively quick fashion, um, how, how – What's the response mechanism as you're rolling out some of these policies as the industry leader where you see competitors start to actually pick it up? I think, uh, well, in this sense, it, last August it was signed the, what was called the Fashion Pact by more than 50 companies in the um, fashion industry with similar targets to this I am mentioning. And I think everybody is getting more and more conscious in the, in the sector that, that uh, we need to become uh, more and more sustainable. I mean, one thing that's fairly obvious from this conversation is however concerned we are about lack of international coordination, the public sector not moving fast enough, there clearly is not only a lot of initiative, but also yeah. speed and coordination yes. in the private sector. So with that, let's go back up to the model, if you don't mind. And I'm going to ask John if he can move a new policy lever, but from the private sector, energy efficiency and electrification and transport and buildings and industry. Let's, let's get some right. efficiency there, because that's so what we're talking about. This captures much of what you just heard about supply chain efficiencies and transport. That helps quite a lot. And buildings and industrial processes. And with moderate levels, we're down to 2.9. This matters quite a bit. Energy efficiency, the fastest, safest, cheapest way to get where we want to go. And how does that efficiency track? What, what sort of savings, I mean, if you give just some numbers behind the model there so people can see what we're looking at? 
you can see the energy intensity of GDP in this bottom right-hand graph under the base case. We do assume it continues through the normal technological progress, but the blue line shows what we've been able to do. This is a very significant improvement, uh, and it, it lags a little because the installed base of existing transport infrastructure and industrial infrastructure is slow to turn over. But we're making quite a large difference here. We're down to 2.9.